Good morning to everybody. After uh, two talks about uh, how do we see magma, now how do we hear volcanoes by using infrasound. Uh, does it work? Okay, um, I'll do it in this one. So uh, there is, uh, physically there is no difference between my voice and infrasound. Um, essentially, the term of infrasound, uh, it's quite anthropocentric, in, in the sense that we uh, take as um, uh, everything that goes, that we cannot hear and that goes below 20 hertz is called infrasound. Everything that it, it is above our, the possibility of our hear to be heard is called um, ultrasound. But uh, um, infrasound goes down to 0.03 uh, hertz. This frequency is called the cutoff frequency and depends uh, string, uh, strongly from atmospheric conditions. The infrasound propagates uh, at the same speed of sound, which is 340 meters per second, but it depends strongly from the temperature of the atmosphere. Below this frequency, you still have a perturbation into the atmosphere, but uh, are not any more acoustic waves because they do not have uh, elastic properties of the atmosphere, and those are called uh, gravity waves. So uh, infrasound is a growing research field, mainly because um, it's due to the development of the CTPTO network. Uh, the CTPTO network uh, is a, a network which was developed mainly to detect nuclear explosions. And uh, um, since we have this network, uh, the record of infrasound has uh, uh, increased, it is growing. And there is another factor that is increasing the use of infrasound in science, especially in physics of the atmosphere and also in volcanology, and is that now we are able to detect infrasound also using cheap and small uh, arrays. Um, one of the CTBT arrays, the cost is around 1 million of euros, so we cannot use uh, infrasound uh, in, uh, uh, to do volcano monitoring. Um, so, um, the, the beauty of what makes infrasound interesting for volcanoes, is, what makes infrasound interesting for volcanoes is that we can detect <coughs> volcanoes erupting from very distant um, point. This is the uh, Calbuco eruption, the recent Calbuco eruption in Chile, and uh, as you can see, the, the sound produced by uh, this explosion was detected by almost all the CTPTO network uh, up to Kenya, which is uh, 11,000 11, kilometers of distance. This, uh, uh, what you see here is the record, record of the infrasonic uh, uh, signal, which was detected by one of the, our stations, which is in, uh, our, uh, in Argentina, and uh, the latency, which is important, because uh, when you have uh, eruptions, you, you need to uh, deliver as soon as you can the onset of the eruption, and uh, you, you can see that uh, the, the latency of the, um, the network is uh, around uh, one hour, two hours, but uh, just by adding a couple of another extra stations in Argentina, this latency is reduced to um, almost 10, uh, 18 minutes. So uh, the, um, the, the way we use uh, uh, infrasound, it's, uh, it's very useful to, because it's able to detect the acoustic waves and the eruptions from very long distance. Uh, but where the infrasound is formed and how volcanoes are generating infrasound, this, uh, there are two possibilities to generate infrasound. When you, have a, when you have a volcano erupting, you have a lot of gas coming at the surface and you, de you decompress the gas, so above the fragmentation level you start to generate a flow of, uh, of materials and uh, this flow which is a volumetric flow, is uh, uh, the source of uh, acoustic pressure. And uh, uh, in other words, we can uh, relate the source, we can relate the acoustic pressure to the volumetric source, to the volumetric flux of the source. So you have to keep in mind that this volumetric flux is somehow the same, the same flux that then we use, we, uh, we used to calculate, for example, the plume height of, um, during an eruption. Um, 
the, uh, there is another source, uh, another possible source for infrasound, uh, which is, comes directly from uh, the plume dynamics. If uh, the plume dynamics uh, it's, uh, has a very high speed, it generates turbulence, and this is another source for infrasound. So essentially, in uh, the infrasound, the pressure is uh, essentially related to the flux of material that is coming out of the vent. Um, uh, this, this gives you, this gives us uh, another possibility, the possibility not only to detect from long range uh, uh, volcanic explosions, but also to uh, use the acoustic pressure to calculate or to have an idea how intense the eruption it was. Uh, you see that using the CTPTO network, um, we have this uh, sort of correlation that, uh, of course, the plume height uh, is correlated also to the quantity of material that is uh, ejected during the, um, the explosions. And you see that the network is detecting as higher is the plume height, the longer is the distance of the detections. So it seems that there is a sort of a correlation between the acoustic pressure generated by the explosions and the plume height. Um, so we, those, those were the reason why in 2010 uh, we came to Iceland. So the idea was to use infrasound to be able to, use, um, to define the mass eruption rate by using acoustic pressure. Um, we installed in 2010, we installed an, an array at almost eight kilometers from Aya Fiatla Yukut uh, volcanoes. And uh, this is the second part of the explosion, of the eruption. And th this is uh, our the detections of the array during the second half of the, of the eruption. You see this is the pressure. And uh, as I was saying before, um, the, the, the pressure is, uh, can be converted in the volumetric flux. And this is what we have done using, of course, some uh, parameters. And uh, you see that uh, well, the, um, the acoustic pressure can be converted into a mass eruption rate. Now, uh, of course, you have to constrain uh, somehow the source, and some of those parameters are uh, could be uh, completely uh, could, could vary in times. So the only way uh, we thought that the good way to check if this mass eruption rate is somehow related, is real or not, is to use this mass eruption rate to model the plume height during the volcanic eruption. And this is what that was done using a buoyancy plume theory, a model which integrates uh, the atmospheric profile. And you can see that there is a quite good fit between the plume height uh, measured by the radar in Keflavik and the plume height uh, derived by acoustic uh, pressure. So um, since uh, then, we during the Future Volk uh, uh, project, we have installed four small uh, infrasonic arrays. You see the arrays here, and uh, this is the deployment of the array. Uh, they have uh, 100 meters of aperture, and they have a sensitivity in 0.1 up to 100 hertz range. The, each array has a real-time process, so the data are processed at the moment in Florence, will be processed next time in, uh, uh, quite soon also at IMO, and all the information are delivered in real-time on a web-based uh, interface. Um, we were expecting to have an explosive eruption, but uh, what uh, we got during the project is uh, uh, mainly a fusive eruption, this uh, uh, all-around uh, eruption. And, uh, but even this eruption that was quite silent in, uh, uh, in terms of uh, sound and noise was generating infrasound, very small infrasound. Uh, uh, this is uh, a spectrogram uh, of the uh, infrasonic waves and... Uh oh okay, doesn't matter. Uh, okay, I go back. Okay, so those are the frequency. What is, is very interesting that this kind of activity, even if it was not a real explosive activity, was able to generate small infrasound. And uh, um, 
we, uh, the array was uh, uh, detecting this activity. This is uh, six months uh, of uh, um, acoustic uh, uh, monitoring of the, the, the eruption. And you see there is a quite good, uh, not quite good fit between the pressure measured by the array and the fusive rate. So somehow the, the, the whole activity at, uh, uh, at this vent was driven by the fusive, uh, the magma fusive rate. It's, uh, it's also interesting that uh, it's also interesting that when we stop to detect uh, uh, waves uh, from this activity, uh, this coincides with the end of the uh, uh, explosive activity at the vent. Um, during the, those three years, but the uh, infrasound was is not uh, only good to detect explosive explosion, explosive uh, events, but we can also everything that moves on the surface of the Earth and generate pressure on the atmosphere is detected by the infrasonic waves. And there was a big uh, landslide in Askia, and this event was uh, uh, detected by one of our array. The strange thing is that was the, the farthest array to detect this uh, event, which was at uh, uh, 250 kilometers from the Askia. Uh, the Bekazimut uh, indicates the direction from where the, uh, the waves, the sound is coming. It's very stable. It is uh, two minutes. Uh, it, it was lasting almost two minutes. So the problem is uh, uh, why the other two arrays was, were not able to detect such, uh, such an event. So what we have done is uh, to model the propagation of the atmospheric uh, or the uh, acoustic waves into the atmosphere. And as you can see, uh, according to the wind direction, wind speed, and also the temperature profile, you generate easily a sort of shadow zone into the atmosphere. And uh, uh, th this is uh, the explanation why the closest arrays were not able to detect such uh, an event. But uh, uh, this, uh, this exercise uh, provides uh, a sort of test that we can able to trace uh, back uh, the, uh, the source and we have, were able to define the onset time of the length side. Um, there is something more uh, to say about the infrasound. Or it, what is clear that the, not only the big explosions are, are detectable by infrasonic arrays, also the small ones. And the, the idea was to use infrasound as a, a tool to do early warning, uh, to deliver early warning alert. Uh, just an example, this is an example of Etna. Uh, you see this is a lava fountain in Etna. This is different from the bulk of all, all around uh, uh, lava fountain are almost one kilometers and are clearly driven by gas. Uh, but those lava fountains are preceded by strong thrombolian uh, by thrombolian activity. In other words, you have uh, thrombolian activity before the volcano starts to generate lava fountaining. And uh, the idea was to use uh, the infrasound, this activity, uh, to uh, provide a sort of pre-alert of uh, lava fountaining. Um, just to show you, there is a movie. You see, this is the okay. This is the trace. This is the infrasonic uh, detections, and this is the thermal camera. And the white ones is the thermal activity at the vent. And uh, you see that uh, uh, before the lava fountaining, the array was already detecting activity inside the conduit. And uh, these, we used this, uh, uh, this time just as a pre-alert. So um, this can be done automatically. And we are doing this uh, exercise uh, from since, uh, since uh, uh, almost five years. Um, and we have, were able to detect almost all the fire fountains, no false alerts, and we deliver the alerts uh, automatically by using emails and SMS. So we hope in the future to have the same system in Iceland and to uh, deliver alert uh, of uh, possible eruptions. Just to finish, uh, there is something more that you can do if you have an infrasonic array and uh, is to measure something that is not acoustic anymore, 
but it's in the real, um, it's in the gravity waves uh, kingdom. So the gravity waves are not elastic waves, are just uh, you can actually observe gravity waves in the atmosphere, probably you have uh, seen it, uh, the, such clouds, uh, those are generated by oscillation of the atmosphere and uh, volcano, in other words, uh, you lift the atmosphere and the atmosphere starts to uh, bouncing up and down. And uh, low pressure and high pressure perturbation generate a lot of gravity waves and uh, also volcanoes generate gravity waves. Uh, these collude eruption and you see gravity waves generated around the volcano. Uh, this is a sort. Uh, this is an example of gravity wave signals uh, related of an acoustic eruption, and uh, using the atmospheric profile, you can uh, model gravity waves uh, uh, in terms of mass eruption uh, rate. Uh, this this is uh, uh, an example from uh, a Montserrat eruption where we were able to define the position of the source and also the mass that you need to move all the, the atmosphere. And this is, I think, it's a future application for infrasonic array, so not only sound. And thanks for your attention, and i leave you with this beautiful picture, I don't know who took it, but uh, it links uh, clearly volcanoes and atmosphere, and this is a perfect place to do that in Iceland. Thanks.